me just start out uh, by saying my name is Steve Soroka and I am Associate Director of Events for the Foundation Fighting Blindness. I have been with the Foundation for 14 years now. I absolutely love what I do, love working for the Foundation. Um, I, I'm not a clinician, so I don't know any technical things, regard, any, anything regarding um, uh, treatments and cures. I know enough to present about them, but, um, but maybe not so much to give you any advice. Some, what I'd like to say is tomorrow's sessions in the morning are for each breakout session for, uh, there's one for AMD, so if you're looking for uh, someone to ask questions to, those are gonna be hosted by uh, Marco Zarbin and Emily, uh, Emily o, uh, Chu. So uh, look on your agenda if you'd like to join those meetings. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to uh, review some of the logistical details for this session. Uh, today's session is being recorded and available in closed captioning. Uh, if, uh, hopefully we get that working right now. Um, to activate the closed captioning, please select closed captioning at the bottom of the interface. If you are using a screen reader, please be aware the controls are at the bottom of your Zoom interface. So if any of you have that now, please um, click that and let me know if you're actually seeing the closed captioning. Uh, this control, control bar may collapse uh, when it's not in use. So if you prefer to prevert, uh, prevent the controls from auto hiding, go to the settings within the Zoom platform, select accessibility, and then select always show meeting controls. So um, all, source, source, uh, all these sessions during our conference are being recorded uh, and will be available to view at a later date. Uh, one of the nice things about this virtual conference, which unfortunately, uh, again, is something very new to us as well, uh, is the fact that a lot of our families from all over the country can join these meetings uh, anywhere. Um, it's a, a, a much nicer savings in cost, and you're able to view all of our, all of our meetings at a later date as well. So uh, it's not quite the same as, as any of you that have been to our meetings. Can I get a, a round of... A, some response from all of you on how many of you guys have attended our meetings uh, when they've been hosted nationally, whether it be in Baltimore or some of the rotating sites like San Diego and uh, Minneapolis. So I've been to the conference, the actual conferences before. This is Michelle Mercer. Hi, Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, quite a bit different uh, situation. Uh, I hosted uh, an in-person meeting for the AMD group in San Diego, which was a which a small group, um, but it was a really nice nice meeting where we were able to chat with the folks and get some information from people. So I, I'd really love for anybody to help participate with the with the meeting and kind of get us going. Um, give your uh, give some of your feedback on things. We have some questions we might be able to ask, but if you have anything related to your eye disease, please uh, please feel free to speak. Um, let me get back to here. So we have, uh, this is our age-related macular degeneration group. Uh, the, the idea behind these sessions is to allow you to meet others from across the country that are affected with AMD uh, and who face similar challenges as you guys do. Uh, feel free to share your thoughts, comments, and ideas throughout the session. So officially before we begin, I, I'd like to encourage you as we have with all of our meetings, including our virtual walk that we just hosted, um, because of the quarantine, we're really limited on um, obviously the face-to-face -face communication or at least the personal uh, physical meeting but this is also a great reason a great way for us to increase the outreach so please feel free to um, share your thoughts and experiences using the uh, hashtag visions 2020 on both Facebook and Twitter uh, if you uh, please please share that info with people if you still have people that, uh, that you that maybe want to join the sessions that you can still sign up and register so um, we have some, some um, uh, sessions tomorrow, and also a really cool thing with uh, our uh, founder, uh, Gordon Gund, is gonna be speaking as well to close the session out tomorrow afternoon. So that would be a really cool thing if you haven't um, met or heard Gordon, he's a, a fascinating man. Um, one of the reasons I, I absolutely love working for here uh, is uh, his uh, leadership with, with the foundation over the last 40 years. Um, so let's get us started here. Uh, does anybody have any questions for uh, any of our group about uh, macular degeneration that you'd like to, to start us out with? Nope. Um, all right, well, let's, uh, I have some uh, questions here that I'd like to start out with. First of all, um, for anybody, uh, what are the challenges uh, you are, all are facing? And maybe what the, maybe introduce yourself and what level of of, of uh, 
vision you still have and uh, what are some of those challenges that you're facing? Anyone, come on. It's a great way to chat with folks. I'd, I'd love to have everybody kind of chat and maybe share some experiences. Hi, this is Michelle Pearson. I don't yet have macular degeneration, but my mother does, and she only has one eye. So she does get the shots in her eyes about every three to four weeks, and she's been doing that for over a year now, and it has maintained. It has not really helped it get much better. So I'm here to learn as much as I can because mm, big chance that I will probably end up getting it, I'm guessing. Okay. Uh, well, it's good. No, it's great to find out more, as much info as you can. Uh, the foundation is here to do that for you. Uh, our website, if you've any of you haven't checked out yet, but I'm hoping that you have. We there's I don't we don't get any uh, kickback for for uh, steering you toward our website, but it is a great, just from what I've heard in the field, let alone people from our staff, uh, a great resource for keeping up to date on not only the. Uh, not only the uh, science and the, the research that we have helped to support in through our funding, but also really any any other projects out that are that are really having any making any headway. Uh, I'd like to think generally we are involved some way in most of those projects, but um, but there's a lot of great things going on across the country and over the uh, across the globe. Uh, so I, if you're looking for any updates on that, please follow our go to our website as well. Um, we have a clinical clip pages there that'll talk about our, all the clinical research going on. Um, also, you can always use an outside reference called clinicaltrials.gov, and that's something that's um, uh, run by the government, and every clinical trial related to vision and, and any other clinical trial is on there. You can just search for uh, AMD and find out what trials are going on. Um, oftentimes, there's a part, uh, possibility that you, could, you or your loved one that's affected could uh, participate in those in those trials, so. So thank you, Michelle, for joining us. Uh, is there anybody else that wants to talk about why you're involved with the foundation? Anyone? Uh, well, Steve, this is Michelle Mercer. You know me because I do work for the foundation, but I actually have a personal interest because both my parents had wet macular in their 80s and 90s, and, oh, wow. my, and my husband's um, on his mother's side had members who had wet macular as well. So I have children and grandchildren, so not only concerned about myself, but also um, the um, younger generations coming up and hoping that we have better treatments and cures while well, there are the shots, and both my parents got the shots. Um, I would say from a family member supporting a, a person with macular, the shots, while they help arrest, is not the ideal way to be getting a treatment to have a shot in your eye uh, every month. So um, I'm hoping that there'll be not only better treatments, but better uh, ways of delivering the treatments that um, are less invasive and less uh, difficult, especially for older members it's not easy for them to travel to the doctor when they get up into their late 80s and 90s and um, so I'm hoping that they'll be better less invasive and uh, treatments that are easier to access in the future. Uh, agreed I, I hear often with those with those treatments uh, just um, how they're done and and you know I, there hasn't been, been much project pro progress that I know of with that form of delivery of the medications um, since I started, um, maybe just uh, maybe it's um, less frequent, but I, that's pretty much the month monthly seems to be pretty normal. Uh, I know some of the more expensive drugs that aren't uh, maybe accepted by insurance might be um, more long lasting, but yeah, that's that's something that we're we're definitely working on. Um, there's a lot of projects across, the, as I said, that are that are trying to work on that as well as other uh, other forms to for treatments, but um, those are pretty much the standard ones that have been around for a long time. So, um, yeah, and I didn't, I didn't realize that, Michelle, that your, your parents were affected. So how is their vision? Uh, 
Well, uh, my father um, passed away in December. He was 97. Oh, yes. So oh, sorry. Um, that's okay. And my mother a few years earlier. Um, so I would say that um, for my, um, my dad seemed to get progressively worse, even though he was getting the shots. Um, so I don't know if there's just a point where you, there it's not able to be effective anymore. Um, right. I know there's that clinical trial with like a little implant that might have the Im medication in it so you don't have to get the shot. Uh, yeah. So that might, hopefully that's going to work out. Um, so most of the time we were supporting our parents and trying to find ways to make life easier for them while they were um, uh, working, you know, living with right. maximum Struggling with, with the visual loss. And I think what... Right. Um, I waited a little too long with my dad, but I think there are some um, interesting things optometrists uh, like at Hopkins are doing that um, have, um, I guess they're very sophisticated eyeglasses that can be customized to a person and to help them use their peripheral ver uh, vision right. better um, as opposed to you know, while you're waiting for a better treatment. So, right. um, but it was a little late for my dad by 95, 96, he really wasn't that amenable to learning how to see a special device anymore. So. Yeah. A lot of, there, there's, there's some workarounds for all their eye diseases right now. And uh, you know, I don't, that's, that's the way to go until we, as we work on the other, maybe more effective treatments and cures, uh, I know that they start. They started out with uh, the eyeglasses, to, um, the lenses that it go it get attached to the retina for uh, other retinal diseases. Um, uh, eyeglasses like you might see in back in the day in the Star Trek. Uh, one of the characters there that had something similar to that with the the vi zoom vision goggles. Um, always and, and always looking for new new ways to advance the treatments and cures. Uh, well, it's one of the things that the foundation is heavily involved with since the start was uh, we're, we're pretty proud of the fact that we've gotten a, a lot of the really kickstarted a lot of the research out there over the years um, back when there's doctors that really don't have any funding uh, other than going to organizations like FFP um, which is uh, as, as this is not really our only marketing tagline uh, we're the world's largest f private funder of retinal degenerative disease research uh, and, and we're pretty proud of that we uh, a little history since uh, we, we've got a few people still joining here um, uh, is that when Gordon Gunn first started, founded the, the, the foundation, uh, there really was no research going on in that area, in, in any area with retinal degenerative diseases. Um, and if you don't know the history of Gordon, please look him up. He's a really uh, fascinating man. He's uh, a true Renaissance man, if Michelle, if you'd agree. Uh, he... Uh, was owner of the San Jose Sharks of the NHL, the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers of the NBA when they drafted LeBron James. So, um, and he's all that time has been affected with RP and is blind from, from retinitis pigmentosa, uh, another form of retinal degenerative disease, uh, de of retinal de degenerative diseases, um, uh, along with AMD, and uh, has done a lot of other things in the city of Cleveland. So uh, uh, his focus has been on finding the best treatments and cures and the best routes to them. So all of you, if that have been hopefully investing with us, helping raise some, fu some funding so we can help fund that research, um, we, we take that money very, we, we, we're very careful with how we spend that money and we make sure that every year we go through the different doctors and researchers, we get presented with a couple hundred proposals for grants for, for fulfilling those. And um, we, we fulfill about 120 to 130 a year um, of the best ones available. We are always looking to have a diverse group of uh, projects going on in any one of our eye diseases that we fund research for. So they're, they're really, uh, up, when I first started um, 14 years ago, we didn't have any uh, clinical trials. Now, right now we're over 40 that are specific to rental diseases, including wet and dry macular degeneration. Um, we fund pri primarily in the country, U.S. and the United States, but we also do a lot of uh, some foreign investments as well. We go where the best research is. Uh, we want to make sure that we are using 
your hard-earned um, fundraising dollars in the appropriate places. So as Michelle was talking about things that, um, that might have helped out her fa mother and father, we, we generally will shift if there's something that we think is a better use of our money. Hopefully the things that we've invested in to begin with are going to the right places and going to the research that's going to help. Uh, but, but research changes. So uh, we, we want to make sure it's going in the right um, pool to, to get you the best uh, things available in the future. So it's, it started out with eye injections and we're hoping something better comes along. And those are things that are in the pipe right now that you'll, um, you hopefully you can learn a little bit about tomorrow as well. So um, is there anybody else I want to, anybody else want to volunteer some information about why they're involved here with uh, the foundation and with this conversation? We'd love to have some more people chat. All right, well, I'll throw out another question then. Um, so we're, other than the foundation, we, we, we are really focused on funding research. Um, are there any other places that you're, you go or your family member goes to get support for any questions or issues you might have with, uh, with, the, with your macular degeneration? Are there like group meetings? Do you know people from from various places you met before, maybe even FFB meetings or events, um, things like that? Come on, anybody? <clears throat> Michelle knows I can talk, but I certainly I don't want to keep up this conversation. I'd love to have uh, you guys chat about what, what issues you face. Um, anybody want to chat up, talk about why you're, why you're joining the call today? Um, who's affected or, or anything like that? We've heard from Michelle and, well, the Michelle squared. Anybody else? All right, if you wanted to be muted, I actually just unmuted anybody just in case somebody didn't know how to unmute. Um, but if you want to remute your screen again, if you're a noise in the background, that's fine. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody had the opportunity that could. Hello from Spain. Um, is an, are you listening to me? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to thank, I am an optometrist, uh, in Madrid. So it's a little bit late here. It's 10 30 PM. Okay. But thank you very much for the foundation for allowing us to be connected and to be part of all these interesting uh, talks that have been yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So as an optometrist, it's been very interesting, and uh, I take this chance to thank you for this meeting. Great, great. Uh, is anybody want to, uh, while I just throw this out there, because I didn't see Maria's image on there, I'll, I'll just say that if you are accidentally have yours turned off in the video screen, um, mm -hmm. you, can un you can show your screen wow with the uh, video button on the bottom. Um, I, I'd love to see some faces, but if you prefer to be, uh, prefer to be uh, just the name on the screen, that's fine too. But I just wanted to make sure that, oh, yay, there we go. <laughs> it's only 30, so it's been a bit late. We have to be a bit more careful in Spain now. <laughs> I hear you. Well, I'm but really I glad that you joined and also were uh, showing your face. I'm, I, I get tired of looking at, at my ugly mugs, so I'm sure that you guys will in, a, in the next 20 minutes, we'll be tired of it too. So thanks so much, for Maria, for joining us. No, thank you for the, for the interesting topics and for allowing us to, uh, to have more information about AMD. Uh, even though now it's a particular times for all of us with the COVID situation, but there's still the percentage of AMD patients, it's, uh, it's high. And uh, as an optometrist in Spain, I'm specialized in low vision, so we deal with... Uh, uh, very many of these patients. So everything we learned from you, everything that is shared in these uh, meetings, it really allows us. And honestly, there has there would not have been the case that I would have had the chance to fly over. So even though it has been because of this special reason, uh, uh, thank you for having these virtual meetings. Thank you. <laughs> our, our pleasure. And I, I appreciate that. Um, so how is it different with... Um, with COVID with you, are, is your, are, your, are your offices still operating there? I don't, I don't think, I think ours are, are shut here for optometry right now. 
uh, well, as it is for Spain, um, it really depends for the first, uh, the first weeks uh, or the clinics were shut down. Uh, as I'm, I am a freelance uh, optometrist, so I work in different, uh, uh, different centers. Some of optometric centers are open, but just the specific hours in the morning. Some hospitals are, have closed and they are starting to reopen now. What it's been uh, interesting is that we have had a lot of calls from elderly wanted to come to the low vision clinic with uh, AMD saying, I want to read. I've been having struggling these last days. And we had to tell them we're not allowed yet. We should be cautious. We have to prevent from anything. So please hold on a bit. And, uh, but it has also been a good chance to talk to people. Um, mm -hmm. People were alone. Some of them were living alone. We are not used to that in Spain. So they really appreciated a talk. And uh, of course we were not performing any low vision examination by phone, but they appreciated our time to see how they are, how they were, where was the last appointment with us and how we could schedule the next one. Uh, knowing that we could not really um, fix an appointment yet in some cases. And now we are able to fix the appointments for uh, for July already with being very cautious with all the um, uh, with all the okay, uh, that, that we have to do. Safety equipment and things like that. Mm -hmm. How is it, uh, over there, you're also, you've stopped seeing the low vision patients or yes, you have said? As far as I know, I, they ha we hadn't have been able to go to like, a, uh, maybe somebody else can ch chime in as well with that, with optometry and op ophthalmology, unless it was an emergency situation, which frankly, I, I, I don't know how that's not a, a something critical for somebody, um, is their vision with getting uh, glasses and going to an optometrist. Um, they've been opening, they've had um, tattoo parlors open for, oh, this, I don't want to get political, but we've had tattoo parlors open, which I'm like, how is that um, a priority over many, many, many other things? Um, I don't know where they got the boost for, for being up in the ladder there, but um, I'm pretty sure that it's just by, emer by emergency situation for, for vision, which is, is really unfair. Uh, I mean, I'm, all right, again, it's, it's nobody's decision, but um, it's, it's too bad because we, we have our, a lot of our families, uh, even if they are affected with, uh, with more serious retinal disease, uh, the eyeglasses are important for our, all our, our, our whole group with, uh, with that. So I, I believe they've opened up now for scheduled like, um, appointments. Uh, is anybody, can anybody else answer that for the U.S.? Uh, uh, Jerry? Uh -huh. We're, I'm here in Oklahoma and I'm at the School of Optometry here. And uh, we opened back up and we was seeing patients by emergency only, but our low vision has started back up but we're seeing everybody on a limited basis. Starting July the 6th, we'll up the amount that we have, but we're trying to get used to all the cleaning and the getting it in and making the patients not uh, build up or, or uh, come, you know, have a, where they have to meet up with each other. So we're trying to do it safely and uh, protect our um, students and um, in our faculty, but our patients too. But, uh, but in our low vision, we just started back up. We see one and uh, spend time with them and then we'll be moving up with more. But uh, we uh, started back, oh, June the 15th, 10th, something like that, we started back up. And we are having summer courses, but we're the only one at the university uh, yeah. that is having classes. So we have to spread everybody out and everybody wears masks. Got my little mask here that we wear around. Yeah. And so um, that's what we're doing here. And we're just being really cautious and safe. Good. But well, it's good to see. Like yeah, go ahead, Maria. Doctors. Uh, may, may I take the chance to, to sure. ask a, um, uh, a question, Jerry? Um, uh, how do you think it's going to change the way we are seeing the low vision patients? Because we surely get very close to them. I was talking today with another colleague from the north of Spain saying we get the text gets very close. We have to wipe the visual acuity tests. Yeah. And it's usually a very warm and close. Uh, um, uh, we have some plastic uh, sheets that we put over. 
and okay. everything. Then you can take it off, wipe everything down. And even our pupilometers, everything, we've got the plastic that covers and everything. And then we've got all the different types of disinfectant and uh, we just, yeah. yeah. Cleaning everything. I was, we are also thinking that the fact that we have had to rearrange the clinics so that there's no waiting rooms allowed. Right. And we are worried that the elderly cannot wait standing up in front of the door if you're late 10 minutes. So the, the uh, appointments are delayed and people wait outside until we call them. So it's been quite a big of a change. I don't know what way you think this is going to stay for forever well, or- We're staggering. We have like our contact lens patients come in around this time and we have the students there ready to take them back and our um, regular eye exams, we're ready to go at maybe the hour, like they start at two. So we're trying to stagger everything out so that nobody has to wait. We have enough room in our waiting room to separate out. But when we have so many clinics and like low vision and everything, we need to kind of stagger out. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. <laughs> it's good to hear what they do over there. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy when you guys are uh, holding up the masks. Um, this isn't a United States thing, and it's it's just like, I have I have some friends in other countries too, and it's just weird. Uh, this is one of the one of the rare things that has connected everybody in some way that's experiencing similar similar fairly similar things all over the country. So it's interesting to hear uh, what the different phases everybody's going through and the different issues everybody's facing through this insanity. So. Uh, great to have you guys join us, J uh, Jerry. Can I ask uh, what you said? What what's is it a school? You said a school of optometry yeah. in Oklahoma, which North uh, it's Northeastern State University College of Optometry. Okay, and we're in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and we work mainly with the Cherokee Nation and other Indian uh, schools. But then we also have the optometry school, and we work uh, doing low vision with uh, the state, and we do. Um, contact lenses some in but with mainly with what we have but we try to have a little bit of everything and we work with a uh, low income uh, like our Lions Club people come in and and for exams and so nice so get a little bit of everything so but it's been nice to see patients again when we're doing classes over zoom and not seeing people and faces and everything. And a lot of, as you know, our tomography classes, you need hands on. And it was really hard to, um, to do that with the students and have them learn. So we're glad to be back. Great, great. Uh, yeah, and you just said something also near and dear to my heart, the uh, Lions Clubs. Uh, Maria, do you have Lions Clubs in your city? In, I'm, I'm in Madrid, in Spain. Yeah, we're worldwide. <laughs> yeah, I'm a lion, I'm a lion yeah, from I'm Arlington High School. Also, the, they also, the, there's also some part of the Lions Club. I, would, I was going to think that that's worldwide. <laughs> I was thinking that what it's very powerful in Spain uh, for low vision is the National Organization for the Blind, ONCE. And uh, for 75 years, they have been running the low vision services. So that's uh, pretty much like a, a healthcare, national healthcare services that everyone can afford. So they have been completely shut until uh, last week. So uh, that's why also private uh, practices have been more overloaded with, uh, with more people. But um, yeah, I think we're getting worldwide organizations are we're everywhere. <laughs> we have a lot of macular degeneration. That's why I came on to kind of learn the latest things or how to relate with these patients. And so that's why I joined on. Me too. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, and I, 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 we were hoping to have more people on here. Um, so I, I don't know if we have had issue with connecting or what, but um, I appreciate you guys joining us and uh, joining in on the conversation because uh, even if it's maybe we're not maybe talking specifically with macular, maybe that will spark, spark some other folks from joining us with the, with the conversation. So thanks so much. Jerry, I, I work with uh, several of the optometry groups throughout the country. Uh, Memphis, uh, Memphis School of Optometry, uh, Indiana School for the Blind, uh, School for Optometry. Uh, what's the other, what's another one? Um, so it's a great, great it's. Yeah, and uh, Illinois and then yep. there's one in uh, Pikesville that's a new school and then the Florida and in Houston and uh, yeah it's good to get new uh, new faces uh, in our professional community to uh, 
to help further our field with that uh, at the optometry level. And then we're also, the foundation also um, rewards grants for opth ophthalmology specifically researchers. Uh, we have a lot of, op of our own researchers and this is for everybody on our call here. Um, we, that we've had a lot of great researchers that we supported in the past and we're always looking to boost those numbers of professionals that are coming on to study and to provide that research down the road. So the foundation also not only provides uh, grant, fu grant research uh, funding for uh, established doctors and institutions, but also uh, we have a couple of grants every year that go toward um, professionals of the future, like a, a, a start out for, uh, for a grant for them. Um, and, and we're hoping to increase the pipeline of the professionals going into that field. So we always have people to replace those researchers, you know, research is going to go on for a number of years. Um, we're, we're doing, we're having some great uh, headway with that, but uh, we always have, we always have the need to fulfill those spaces that might be um, left by somebody that might be retiring. We have a great doctor in Chicago, Gerald Fishman, who recently, recently retired. Um, so some of those professionals are, are getting up there in age and we want to make sure that we have those people uh, coming through and it's good to see the optometry groups uh, as well in the schools and we get a lot of participation from them at all of our events. Uh, one of my best friends it was really cool and I, this is a sorry, personal story, but uh, I'm, I'd love to hear more of these. Um, I invited her and her mom to one of our kickoffs for our walk and she, um, she was still in high school. This was a few years ago. And she had, she had nobody in her family affected with any sort of vision loss. Um, but she did it because her, her mom was at a joint and it was a free lunch. And I'm really happy to say that she just graduated from the Indiana School for Optometry wow. this year. So yeah, really cool, uh, cool connection. And I'm sure I had no influence over her, but it was nice to see because she saw all our families that are really passionate about what they do. Um, obviously, um, supporting themselves, trying to get some help from themselves or their family. And to see someone to identify that there's a need, um, it's great to have you guys uh, helping us with that and, and, and on a worldwide level as well. So anyway, thanks so much. Um, and so speaking of anecdotes, is there anybody on the call that has something maybe that's humorous has happened because of your vision or some story you might want to share um, with something like that? No. All right. Um, are there any questions, anything else you guys would like to ask? Maybe that'll spark some conversation. Uh, let's see what else we have. Um, all right, well, I'll ask this. How many of you are on the, on the phone that are using a, are, are completely blind or are using a cane or a guide dog? Anybody? No. Um, all right, here's a good one. This one should get some, I want, I want to get some response here. I want to get uh, some, some conversation because you never know like something silly that you, you, that you use, or maybe not silly, but something that you think everybody's heard of or something that nobody's heard of. Um, and and that, that'll, that sometimes is something that will um, really help somebody out. So we have a lot of um, technology that our folks use for, for uh, when they're losing their sight or have lost their sight. Um, is there any technology that any of you guys use for your daily activities uh, or certain apps that you use that might be something that uh, somebody else might not have heard of before that you'd like to share? You Kathy, was that a, an acknowledgement maybe that you have something? Yeah. Yes. I, is it, can you turn up the volume on your... That help? A little bit. I have audio books and um, I have all kinds of things that help us. Magnifying glasses everywhere and um, double spatula to turn things over with and uh, special nice. spots on places where I know where um, the timer is or the bake is on the toaster oven. and. Um, all kinds of neat little things, a bright flashlight. So have you used much of the new like technology for a phone or other device like that that's mobile? No, just my Kindle book to, for taking with me to read, I can increase the font. 
Yeah, those are those are good ones. Um, so uh, for anybody out there, I would also recommend if you have a local, every city has their local um, support group or support organization that's similar. Well, uh, well like in Chicago, it's uh, Lighthouse for the Blind. In Milwaukee, it's Vision Forward. Cincinnati Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Uh, uh, Alpha Point in Kansas City. All, every, almost every city has uh, an, a, an organization that specifically can help with the broad ranging needs of our community other than research. Um, we're, we're pretty proud of the fact that we th we're, we're the largest in the world and we feel we do that really well. Um, but there's things that we don't, we, aren't, we, we don't profess to be the best at. And that certainly is support services. Uh, we try to have social uh, meetings for people to get together, but those organizations in every city are really important for our families. Uh, we, for, we partner with those groups all over the country. Um, that's why I was able to rattle off so many of those. Um, every city I work with has a group like that and they're um, as equally dedicated as we are. Um, I would check with them if you guys are looking for any sort of of support for your vision, whether it be what Kathy had said, a lot of great things that she uses in her house that you might not think of um, and might be something really simple to help you out. They have all that stuff in their store usually that you can peruse or they can help you with to get simple things done. Obviously, there's the old school, the, the enlargement for the magnifying glasses and um, things to put on your materials at your house. But more so now, technology has taken such a huge leap that a lot of our a lot of our people that are affected with not only just some 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 vision loss but complete vision loss, uh, folks that are blind who really have, are are very they want to be very independent, and we want to help them, and we want to make sure that we get them to the right resources. I would check with those places if you need help with that any of that stuff. Just let me know; I can connect you with it. We have uh, connections pretty much anywhere like that. They'll provide things like, like apps. So when I started, there was somebody that would come and volunteer in our office, and she had this piece of equipment that was like the, the old school cell phones that had to be the size of a, a foot long and five inches wide, and uh, it cost her like $1,400. Um, the, the things that she could use with that piece of equipment that long ago, you can buy now for your cell phone for 99 cents. Um, so those are things like that I identify De, uh, denominations of money, Ident they identify colors in your closet for clothing, uh, especially now with the improvement of GPS to get you around a city, um, a walking city with, with your, with, without any uh, device. I mean, usually you'll, you still want to use a cane, but uh, if, you're, if you do, or, uh, or some other things, but the GPS with your phone is so, it, it really has increased the, the independence of our families. Uh, dramatically just in the last couple of years. Um, uh, one, one brief one that I wanted to uh, highlight, at our last visual visions conference in San Diego, where we actually were there uh, in a beautiful, beautiful pool, a beautiful resort, um, that'll be next year, I promise, or, or, or soon. But there was, a, we had somebody there that was a vendor that had mapped out the entire hotel, the entire resort. So with his app, you could walk easily to the washroom, to the cafeteria, the restaurants, back to your room. Um, and so they've gotten those things mapped out for certain stores, uh, things like that. So there's a lot of really cool things out there. If you have not tried to find those and you need help with that, please, uh, please reach out to your local um, support services for the blind and visually impaired, or, or you can always contact me. I'm available anytime pretty much 24-7. Uh, uh, so I'd love to hear from you if you need any help with that. So. Uh, Kathy, do you have any tech, any other things like that that you can share? Another little thing that fits in a cup to tell when the water levels at the top it beeps. Oh wow! I'd actually a, never heard of something like that. I have a talking thermometer to check the meat temperature. Nice. Well, I, I, does anybody else have any things that they use that might be helpful for somebody? Hey, this is um, Michelle Mercer. Um, when my dad, you know, uh, for the, our parents, there was sometimes it was just the simplest thing that would be a huge frustration. And so um, with the phones, but also with something like Alexa, you can ask the time 
you don't have to try and read it at a clock. Um, so, um, and then on his microwave, we would put like a white um, tape that he could see which buttons, the buttons that he liked to use. So sometimes they really want to be self-sufficient and you have a tendency to say, oh, well, we'll help you with that. But it's really important that they don't lose that self-sufficiency. So um, audio books, you can ask your phone or you can ask Alexa to read audio books. That helped my dad a lot. Um, when he first started losing his sight, the Kindle was great. He could get the expanded fonts and things like that. But then as it got worse and worse, um, he, the audio books were really uh, good for him. So I think even this, the simplest kind of daily tasks that you might think aren't that important are really important to think of ways to help them to do that on their own. Great points, great points. And the, the one specifically when you're talking about independence, uh, I, I, I am amazed, uh, honestly. Um, many of our families that are affected have lost, been losing their vision over the years while I've here been here and Michelle has been here for many years as well. They become friends of ours. So when we see the vision lo decreasing, that's, that's hard to do, uh, hard to take. Uh, I've had friends of mine who would identify me from across the room uh, when I first started and say, hello, Steve, and wave to me and all that, who literally are standing in front of me now and do not know who I am. And um, that's, that inspires us. And um, it, it, you'll see the independence of our families. They come to our events. They, many of them don't want help. And, you know, and, and I understand that. We understand that. Um, but to get them to acknowledge at least that there are tools available that can help them uh, be independent. Um, everybody uses those, everybody uses it. I use my GPS uh, all the time um, and I have a perfect vision, well, sort of, but enough. Um, so using those tools, if that can help you uh, increase the amount of independence you have, um, please check those out. There are so many of them available now. Um, there are many companies that are investing in this because there's there's a need for that, and um, and those are great suggestions. Uh, the the fact about independence that's the thing that's um that's always been amazing to me is, um, our uh, the the folks that are blind or visually impaired, um, they 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 thrive on that, and you want you want everybody to get out and do what they what the, what they can do, what they want to do, and give them every opportunity for that. So. If these are things that you can help with getting your family to go and try out, um, please do that. Um, if there's other resources that you're looking for, please seek those out or have, or if you're affected personally, check those out. There's the, um, there's so many out there. Um, and I, I, I have a, I, I like my anecdotes. I, I was hoping this meeting where I would, wouldn't be talking about anything and just letting you guys chat, but uh, maybe the, uh, try to spark some conversation. And here's one of them that I, there's something that I always, um, uh, remember when I talk about the independence of our families and how the foundation can be the conduit to getting those people to where they need to go, whether it be to the optometry office. Um, we work with the optometry offices throughout my cities that I'm involved in, um, and, and then they lead those folks on. If they can't handle what, their, what the diagnosis is, they lead them on to an op ophthalmologist and then on to a retinal specialist. I had a story uh, years ago. I, ran, I do my walk in Kansas City. And I had a phone call way, way at the beginning of when we were starting these, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, uh, from a woman who uh, was, we gave me a call, and I, I, I didn't know how old she was, but she started talking about her little boy, her little son that just got diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, um, and he was nearly, he, had, he was going blind, uh, was nearly blind. Um, he had gotten, you know, I, I think the deal was he had gotten, uh, he knew of the vision loss, but they had never got. They never wanted to go to the doctor to find out specifics. Um, but he was. They never could get him to go see a, uh, a, a someone that could get him a, a guide dog. And he just didn't want to leave the house. And you know, I'm thinking it's the little boy she kept referring to, her little son. Uh, and here I'm imagining his. You know, he's 12 years old, and she's in her 30s. I, I have no idea. I talked to her on the phone. So when she showed up at our walk, she walked up to me and, and I'll say the first name, Elaine, she was, uh, she's in her 70s. 
and she introduced me to her little boy, who is her 45-year-old son, and I, I was like, you know, I guess she's, he's always going to be her little boy, um, and she was in tears because her son, for the first time, had met with the puppy raisers who were at our walk. We had a table there from the local puppy raisers group, which we always try to invite all the different organizations. We invite every optometry group. All, we, we always do that um, because you never know what's going to happen. Um, that is a memory that I'll never forget because it was something where he connected and got the connection he had to get his first guy, uh, dog. Um, and that just not would have not have happened if it wasn't for those events. So uh, anytime I hear of anybody that can help us out with a new resource, I am always on top of that. I try to remember those things. Um, so I, I hope some of the things that we've talked about today will spark you to maybe present those to somebody that you love who is affected that maybe can help them out as well. So sorry, I, I like stories. I hate uh, Anybody else have anything like that? Maybe something that they've provided for some of their um, family that might help out? Or do we cover pretty much a good part of that? Good resources is um, social services for the blind. Kathy, where are you located? Can you, if you don't mind me asking, what city? In North Carolina. Okay. In the foothills. So you have a group that you could do, go and meet with them socially? No, but they, they'll send a nurse to the house and then she'll go through all the things that they have that you might benefit, benefit from. That's, th thank you for that. If anybody hasn't, so I was talking about going to a facility uh, it sounds like social services can help out with going to your your, your home or your, your loved one's home. Um, that's, that's a great one. Yep. My stepdaughter trains guide dogs. Oh, nice. What, uh, what, or, what organization is it, do you know? No, but I think they come out of New York. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I think Leader Dogs is in Michigan, and the, the, the other big one is in New York. I'm trying to think of... What that is. Yeah, those are great groups. Anybody else? All right. Well, I, 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 I hope this was of value. I, again, I didn't mean to be the one speaking as much as I did, but I, um, I, I really love doing these things. Um, why I, it's, it's, it's a lot, obviously more fun when it's live and we can share some things and go out to the bar afterward, maybe. Um, but I thank all of you. Does anybody have any closing questions for us or I think uh, we are always available as a resource, the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Uh, check out our website. Uh, we have people, we have great staff that want to help out in every way and, uh, and a very dedicated staff. And if you have questions that we can't answer, we'll direct you to the, get you to the right person. Uh, we, we're here to help you guys. Um, that this is what we do. And, uh, if you have questions about this meeting, you can also, as I said, is these are going to be recorded, uh, all the other sessions, so please join those. Please, again, as I mentioned, tomorrow more, uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, or Eastern Time, uh, is the, uh, the, the specific AMD meeting that will be more of a technical um, presentation. So, uh, Jer Jerry and Maria, if you're able to do that, that's probably the one you're get more information from as far as technical parts uh, of, of what we do. So I, I'd love for you to join those. Um, and again, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you, uh, if you can support the foundation now, I know it's tough times, but we'd love to have your support, but just be safe and healthy. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at one of our uh, in-person events sometime in the future, including Maria. Thank you, Steve. You guys have a good night. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, Kathy. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.